Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Art and I are with the fabulous Dr. Liz Lister. Dr. Liz, MD, welcome. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Liz. Um, I have a, a, a topic that seems to be coming in and out of the news all the time, uh, particularly in the area of women's health. Uh, and have, having a wife and two daughters and a daughter-in-law and, and friends, uh, it seems to be a lot of uh, confusion about uh, uh, things dealing with cervical cancer. Uh, could you uh, maybe help clear up uh, or, or give us a, a guide path for uh, our loved ones on what that's it's all about and why is it seems to change so much? Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of discussion about it and a lot of confusion, as you said. The most remarkable advance since the pap smear was developed in the 1940s to screen for cervical cancer is the discovery of the role of the human papilloma virus, HPV, in causing cervical cancer in women. And it's estimated that up to 80% of women eventually become, the, they use the word infected with HPV. I don't really like that. It sounds really terrible. However, it is sexually transmitted virus. And uh, in my estimate, from what I've seen, it's probably even higher than that. But that is what I've seen in the studies, is that 80% of women over their lifetime will be discovered to have been exposed or infected with HPV. Hmm. That's amazing. That's a, it's yeah. a terrible statistic. Right. Now, you exactly. said sexually uh, transmitted, but men don't suffer from HPV, do they? They do. They absolutely do. The challenge is that the test that is now used, I was looking over the history of the test the first HPV test was approved in 1988, and I started my residency in 1990. And I remember by the second or third year of my residency, we were using an HPV test at the same time that we did the pap smear on a woman. And it was the HPV test was with a little Q-tip, a little swab. All right. And that's back in the days when we were still doing a pap smear onto a glass slide. Those days are gone. Nowadays, a pap test is done in what they call liquid cytology. So the cells, it's just a little brush, it doesn't hurt, uh, it's not very comfortable, but it's not painful, and it gathers the cells and it's just stirred in a little vial of a particular liquid, so liquid cytology, and they can run the HPV test at the same time. The reason I'm bringing that up, John, in answer to your question is that if we still had the swab, very old fashioned and gone from the technology, we could test men. We know ah. men are affected. It's typically in uncircumcised men. There are parts of the world where large percentages of men are not circumcised, and they're shown to have an increase in this. It's called a squamous cell cancer, either of the cervix in women or sometimes of the penis in men. It's very, it's extremely rare, if at all, in men who have been circumcised. So definitely affects men, just not as often as it does women. We women have the, the vaginal environment is a warm, moist environment for all kinds of organisms to hang around and thrive. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I hate to take us too far off the topic uh, of cervical cancer. Right. But it does beg the question, why aren't men tested for HPV? Or, or whatever the name of the yes. version is for men. Number one, because of the change in the technology of the test. Number two, because they usually are not the ones that are affected with any kind of problem. So again, the, the development of a cancer is so unusual, especially here in the United States, as opposed to about 14,000 cases per year, new cases of cervical cancer among women. It's just the numbers don't justify the routine deployment of the test. Plus, again, the swab test, I believe that it's pretty much gone from use. And that would be the, the main way to be able to test a man. 
Okay, so so I'd like to see if we can get uh, maybe a, a little up note on this. Uh, Absolutely. And and in two areas. Number one, uh, is it would it be true like with uh, uh, skin cancer and things like that? The earlier you detect it, the better chance you have of curing it. Okay, and how often should you be uh, looked at for uh, a testing uh, for cervical cancer? Okay, perfect. So let's make sure I cover both of those questions. Help me remember, Art. Number one, the answer is absolutely. That's the best part about HPV testing. One thing that has been discovered over the last couple of decades is there's what they call genotyping. Genotyping of the HPV, the virus itself, there are at least 14 different types. Some are low risk to develop to cervical cancer, some are middle, and some are high risk. All right, so this has become a cornerstone used across the board, at least that in the United States, testing for HPV along with the PAP test. So it's called co-testing. And what that does is it saves women from getting painful biopsies when they don't need to. So for example, in younger women, the PAP might show some abnormal cells. However, we now know that those cells will normal, they'll, they'll normalize, they'll go back to normal. The body has an incredible ability to heal, especially if she does not have any of the high-risk HPV types. Again, we're, it's hard to keep it so that it's not confusing. So you've got co-testing, you've got the PAP, and you've got the HPV test. When you have both together, you only need to refer for further evaluation and cervical biopsy when there's the presence of the high-risk HPV types. And how curable is that if, let's say, it is detected? Very. Highly, highly curable. It's catchable before it's cancer. There's a step right before cancer called carcinoma in situ, or CIS. Hmm. All right. And CIS is, is very, very treatable. Highly, highly treatable. So out of those 14,000 cases of cervical cancer, that's pretty low compared to other cancers that happen in women and in people in general. It's very nice and low. And half of those cancers occur in women who have never had a pap. Hmm. So when women go and get tested, they can avoid getting cervical cancer. This is a preventable cancer. Awesome. And, and uh, uh, the other half of the question is, um, uh, how often uh, should you be tested? Uh, is it only in sexually active people? For instance, uh, with colonoscopies, after the age of 70, 70, they say, don't even bother anymore because it's so, if you haven't had it before then, it's so slow moving uh, that you really don't want to have colonoscopies and stuff like that. So there's sort of like that kind of trend with that kind of thing. What about with uh, testing for uh, cervical cancer? Uh, this is a question that makes me kind of sigh a little bit because it depends on who you ask. All right. There are recommendations based on, as you said, if a woman has been sexually active or she's currently sexually active, a uh, number of different partners, all of the testing regimens that I have seen end at age 65. And I think that is wrong. I think that is the wrong approach, especially nowadays. I think it should vary based on a woman's individual situation. So for example, nowadays we have women with increasing incidence of sexually transmitted infections, including HPV, after the age of 65, when they, they may have a, a spouse who passes away and they may be in a new environment in their living situation where they meet a new partner. That woman should be checked out. She should be tested. So there are different protocols depending on how often it should be. My day when, my, when I was doing gynecology full time of doing a pap every year, that's not the recommendation anymore because we have the HPV testing. As long as the HPV test is negative or low risk, it really is okay to not have the PAP every single year. But for any woman to be told they never need it again, 
that always makes me, I mean, there are situations if she's in one relationship, no other partners, has a normal pap with a negative HPV test, she can definitely for sure go more than a year. The idea is up to three years. But the idea for me of stopping altogether forever at any point in time, that doesn't sit that well with me. But those are the current recommendations. Well, I like your approach better. <laughs> that that's uh, this is a great eye opener um, information and a wonderful update on the science too. Really appreciate it, also, Dr. Liz. Thank you so much. Uh, but before we go, actually, uh, uh, we're, we're two guys asking questions that really relate ninety nine percent towards uh, women who would pay more attention to this kind of stuff. Uh, who uh, if uh, I go to a GP uh, and I have a, a, a dermatologist uh, for because I, I, I constantly watch out for skin cancer and catch everything early, so it's been great. But uh, my wife seems to have about three or four main doctors for different things. She, she has a GP, she has a gynecologist, and some other people uh, in her life. But um, it, who would order this? Would a GP, let's say you have an annual lab test, is this is something that would normally go on that, or would you wait to see your gynecologist and have that person uh, order this kind of test? Who should, who should be in charge of that? That's a wonderful question. I'll tell you why that's an interesting question. The answer to your question is the gynecologist is typically the person. Primary care doctors often do the pap test. So if that's who does that individual's pap, then that's the doctor who's going to follow that protocol and most likely be aware of these recommendations to also do the HPV test. It's the same little bottle of liquid that goes to the lab, so that's easy to do. The reason that it's an interesting question is because the World Health Organization, right, you've got the American College of OBGYN, you have the American Cancer Society, you have these various groups that have deep investment in women's health, the, but the World Health Organization, because they deal with a lot of areas around the world with minim, minimal access to healthcare, they are using a protocol and promoting a protocol of HPV testing. It can be done at home. There is a way for women to self-test so they don't have to go to a doctor and they can test for HPV. If the HPV test is negative, then they're okay, and they don't necessarily need to go get a pap test. Again, I don't want to add to the confusion, so I will say that basically in the United States, our approach is the pap and HPV co-testing, and the HPV test is extremely helpful in determining a woman's risk for developing cervical cancer, which takes a long time to develop. The only real way for a woman to get cervical cancer these days is to not go get checked. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, well, well that's a hmm. kind of a mix of good news and bad news. Not bad news. It's the old HPV. It's it's yep. there. It's we been around it. forever. There's evidence yeah. of HPV in mummy tissue. It's been around oh. a long time. <laughs> oh, thank you, mom. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Liz. Uh, again, uh, we hope that this helps some of our audience uh, better understand it. Uh, if you're a woman, uh, you probably know a lot of this, but uh, the severity of uh, the disease is uh, not so bad if you catch it early in most cases. So don't be afraid to have the test and find out. That's what we always say. And by the way, one last little piece is whether you have uh, multiple doctors or not, uh, sharing of the information, tests, and everything else is so easy and widespread today that uh, you can easily insist upon each of your doctors sharing that information with the other so that nobody is blinded to information that they might have that would help in diagnosis. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you again soon uh, because you're always helping us with some very, very important information that could save lives. Thank you. My pleasure. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.